Many of you may be familiar with Norse mythology through the Marvel uh, Universe and the Thor movies that have been produced. Um, I think it's one of the more intricate uh, and detailed mythologies, uh, but we really need to look at the Scandinavian culture as a whole and how this book was formed, just like we looked at how the Bible was formed. The last ice age from around 110,000 to 10,000 BCE um, covered most of Scandinavia and half of Europe. Uh, the Scandinavian land was all but un uninhabitable and there were very few people living in the northernmost regions of Europe at the time. It was just too cold for people, livestock, and most vegetation to survive there. The first inhabitants of northern Europe and Scandinavia were reindeer hunters. They were nomadic, and they reached modern-day Norway and Sweden around 7,000 BCE. Um, these people were hunter-gatherers. Um, they followed the reindeer and the salmon migrations um, to sustain their life and their culture. However, ice ages during this period um, were very flex flexible, and um, while the massive ice age had kind of moved away, um, they still had many ice ages in this area, which kept this tribe uh, nomadic for quite some time. Around 5000 BCE, things begin to shift as they do across much of Europe. Farming and animal husbandry or ranching were mastered. Communities no longer were no longer really required to follow the caribou uh, and the salmon as much so they could actually settle and start settlements. Uh, Scandinavian countries began to develop thanks to these newly learned skills. Um, we know this because we found ancient tools used for farming and ranching that date from this period. And this period is known as the Neolithic period. Um, here you can see some of the little nuts and bolts and um, knives and spears that were used by these early farmers around 5000 BCE. Around 4000 BCE, we began to see an Indo-European invasion, aided in which aided in populating most of Europe and Scandinavia. This invasion led to the commingling of many different cultures. These invaders were the earliest invaders of the Greek, Roman, and Indian civilizations. Um, the invaders arriving in Scandinavia first arrived uh, through Germany and in doing so spread the elements of the Germanic people to the Norse tribes. And you'll see many similarities in the cosmology of the two. Uh, German myths and Norse mythology is very similar and dependent on each other in some ways. The period from 3200 to 1500 BCE was known as the Bronze Age and the Norse were known as a battle axe culture. This new culture was highly individualistic and patriarchal, although shield maidens played a heavy role in the takeover and wars that Vikings uh, participated in. Uh, shield maidens uh, ran the front lines for the warriors. Um, they were equal in battle and could hold a place at Valhalla. Uh, this culture, like no other, was ruled by men, uh, and their conquests leave little to doubt that legacy, but women did play an integral part of this society. Uh, the development of bronze metallurgy produced more efficient weaponry, like the battle axes seen here, and made the shipbuilding and trade process of Norsemen highly profitable. Oddly enough, during this period, the climate was very mild, making these tribes flourish uh, through their agricultural success. They even cultivated fine vineyards uh, in Northern Europe and Southern Scandinavia. Norse religion begins to emerge during this period from the larger body of the, of the Germanic mythologies. Um, those who worshiped these gods, as you know, um, were known as the Vikings. Early forms of North mythology focused on duality. They used twin gods to symbolize this duality. There were forms of ritual sacrifice to these gods. They often sacrificed animals and occasionally humans. They also left gifts for the gods as sacrifice. Uh, things like weapons, jewelry, and other spoils of war they acquired. Um, and they offered these in a ritualistic manner. This is much like any other early civilization we have encountered this semester. 
from 500 BCE to 500 CE um, is known as the Iron Age, and it brought about the rapid progression of civilizations like the Greeks and Romans. These advancements were largely in part due to the improvements of weaponry, iron made swords, axes, spears, and daggers, which were much more durable than the Bronze Age weaponry. Uh, the Scandinavian countries were also experiencing what is known as the Iron Age Cold Epoch, which was a huge climate shift that ultimately led, led to those first Viking explorations. Um, these first Viking explorations were because it, they were experiencing a mini ice age and they needed to find land for these civilizations that had grown um, with their knowledge of farming and ranching. Um, so they set out um for new land um, this expands the trade in this area it also expands the language and allows the allows for the melding of myths um, so we see this scandinavian area kind of meld myths with german um, and english even mythologies and it becomes very it becomes very much known as um, the Viking mythology, but it can be Celtic, Norse, Irish. It's all kind of blends together due to this uh, this expansion that was going on during this period um, while the Vikings were looking for new land. The Viking expansion really got rolling on June 8, 793 CE, when Vikings from Denmark invaded and destroyed the Christian monastery on the small island of Lindsay Farm on the eastern coast of northern England. They attacked the monks in response to the Saxon wars of the Christians against the pagan Norse. Unlike the previous Viking Age, which co uh, this period coincided with a warm period when temperatures in the north were really mild. So the Vikings weren't invading for other places uh, to get away from the cold, but rather this was in response to the Saxon war campaigns of the Christians against the pagan Norse led by Charlemagne. Charlemagne was the first Holy Roman Emperor, and as such, he tried to Christianize the North, um, killing anybody that didn't agree to become a Christian. Uh, the Viking expansion uh, should be best known not for the killing, but for shipbuilding and exploring. Viking ships were fast, powerful, and flexible. They could navigate rivers as well as oceans. Um, which made them uh, able to go inland much further and conquer um, settlements further upriver. They could also go on the coastline too and across the ocean in the boats that they had. Uh, they could handle very long distances and the long distances led to the ability to explore places that no one in Europe had ever ventured like Iceland, Greenland, and eventually North America, which they reached about 500 years before Columbus. Uh, Viking culture placed an emphasis on both trade and honor, especially honor in war. Uh, this was the one way to establish both honor and trade since defeating an enemy meant that some of your own people could live there. So they would go in and they would defeat the enemy and they would leave behind settlements and make their own expansion as they went along. The Viking expansion led them all the way around the southern part of Europe, around Italy and Greece, into the Mediterranean Sea, and then up into the Black Sea through the Ukraine and Russia, and of course as far west as North America. Leif Erikson, at least a half a century before Columbus, um, landed in America. He died in around 1025. Of course, he reached Newfoundland off the coast of Canada. We know about the attack on Lindsay Farm uh, because it was recorded in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle from 793, which reads, In this year, dire portents appeared over Northumbria and sorely frightened the people. They consisted of immense whirlwinds and flashes of lightning, and fiery dragons were seen flying in the air. A great famine immediately followed those signs, and a little after that, in the same year, on the 8th of June, the ravages of the heathen men miserably destroy, destroyed God's church on Lindsay Farm with plunder and slaughter. As you can see, they're, they're talking about seeing fiery dragons um, flying in the air. And if you think about what a Viking ship looked like, um, they had these dragon heads intricately carved on the front of the helm of their boats. Uh, they're metaphorically referring to the ships uh, and the settlements 
that are well, as they're waiting across the bay there they're starting fires and they're you know kind of settling waiting to invade these foreign countries and um the anglo-saxon people are seeing this um and they're recording it but they're recording it in a very mythical way in a very metaphorical way which is how myths really represent uh or misrepresent some of the things that are happening you may be wondering how these myths came about and how they were actually formed into the book or collected into the book known as the Poetic Eddas. Um, so let's take a quick look at where these myths come from. Uh, Snorri Sturluson, who lived from around 1179 to 1241, compiled what is known as the Poetic Eddas and gave the Nordic people roots. Um, he was an Icelandic historian, poet, and politician. He collected and wrote some of the poetic uh, Eddas. His contrib contribution places the gods in the traditional framework that links the origins of the Nordic and Germanic regions with the cultures of Greece and Rome. Uh, so he's putting these books together. He, the tales that he's found, the tales that he's come ac across, and he's also writing his own um, in a time where uh, Greek and after Greek and Roman influence. Um, the Prose Edda contains uh, the best surviving records of Norse mythology. Uh, it's four parts, the Prologue, the Gilfening, the Skalls and Parmel, and the Hatal. Uh, Norse mythology is taught for the most part using these Eddas, so Snorri's contributions solidify the ancient Norse cosmogony for us today. Let's switch our attention to the cosmogony themselves. We can be begin by discussing the elaborate structure of the non-distinct worlds. Um, I've included this world tree called Ix Yggdrasil, um, which kind of highlights the non-distinctive worlds. And in the middle, you see Midgard, which is the mortal realm where the humans live. Um, it's where the court of justice is held. Um, to the upper left you'll see alfenheim which is where the elves live uh, this is where freyr the lord of the elves is from um, then you'll have see svaltenheim uh, to the lower right this is where the black elves or the dwarves are from the dark elves um, then you'll see vanheimer or veneer uh, to the upper right Veneer, where the other gods reside, like Freya and Freyr. And then immediately to the left, you'll see Muspelheim, the fire, which is where Sut uh, or Surt lives. And this is the original ice and fire elements that we'll see in the myth itself. Um, sixth, you'll see Jotunheim, where the giants live. Uh, this is also where the well of Mimir is. And then to the right, you'll see Niflheim, which is the originating ice. Uh, the realm of the frost giants is from here. And then, of course, Asgard to the north, uh, which is the home of the gods. This is where Valhalla is, the Hall of the Fallen. If you die in battle in uh, Nordic mythology, you go to Valhalla to dine with the gods. And this is the ultimate goal of all Norse warriors. Um, and then, of course, to the south, we see Helheim, um, or the realm of lost souls, uh, the underworld, as we know, it's often referred to as hell. Um, in the middle, you'll see the Rainbow Bridge, which crosses from Adgar Asgard to Midgard. It's a portal for the gods, uh, as many of us know from the Marvel franchise. Um, but this elaborate world tree uh, comes into play in other myths that we'll see later. Uh, so I wanted you to kind of be familiar um, with things like a rainbow bridge um, and these trees associated with planets and lives. And if you'll notice, there's nine planets or nine worlds, just like the nine planets. The Norse story of the origin of the Earth, sky, and humanity is paraphrased from Snorri Sturluson's Edda and translated by Anthony Fawkes. Um, I'd like to read it out loud because it's short. 
in the beginning of time there was nothing neither sand nor sea nor cruel waves neither the heaven nor the earth existed instead long before the earth was made niflheim was made and in it a spring gave rise to twelve rivers to the south was muspel a region of heat and brightness guarded by cert a giant who carried a flaming sword to the north was the frigid gununagap where the rivers froze and all was ice where the sparks and warm winds of Muspel reached the south side of the frigid Gununagap, the ice thawed and dripped, and from the drips thickened and formed the shape of man, and his name was Ymir, the first of an ancestor of the frost giants. As the ice dripped more, it formed a cow, and from her teats flowed four rivers of milk that fed Ymir. The cow fed on the salt of the rime ice, and as she licked a man's head began to emerge by the end of the third day of her licking the whole man had emerged and his name was Buri, and he had a son named boar who married bestula a daughter of one of the giants and boar and bestula had three sons one of whom was odin the most powerful of all the gods Ymir was a frost giant but not a god and eventually he turned to evil after the struggle between the giant and the young gods boar's three sons killed Ymir. so much blood fro flowed from his wounds that the frost giants were drowned but one who survived only by building an ark for himself and his family boar's sons dragged Ymir's immense body to the center of gap and from him they made the earth Ymir's uh, blood became the sea, his bones became the rocks and crags, and his hair became the trees. Boar's son took Ymir's skull, and with it made the sky. In it they fixed sparks and molten slag for Muspel to make the stars and other sparks they set to move and pass just below the sky. They threw Ymir's brains into the sky and made the clouds. The earth is a disk and they set up Ymir's eyelashes to keep the giants at the edges of that disk. On the seashore, Boar's son found two logs and made people out of them. One son gave the breath and life, the second son gave them consciousness and movement, and the third gave them faces, speech, hearing, and sight. From this man and woman came all humans thereafter, just as all the gods were descended from the sons of Boar. Odin and his brothers had set up the sky and stars, but otherwise they left the heavens until unlit. Long afterwards, one of the descendants of those first two people that the brothers created had two children. Those two children were so beautiful that their father named the son Moon and the daughter Sol. The gods were jealous already, and when they heard of the father's arrogance, they pulled the brother and sister up to the sky and set them to work. Sol drives the chariot and carries the sun across the sky, and she drives so fast the skies of the Northland, because she is chased by a giant wolf each day. Moon, likewise, takes a course across the sky each night, but not so swiftly, because he is not so harried. The gods did leave one pathway from the earth to heaven, and that is the bridge that appears in the sky as a rainbow, and its perfect arc and brilliant colors are the sign of its origin of the gods, and nothingness, and none, it nonetheless will last forever, because it will break when the men of Muspel try to cross it into heaven. This myth has many elements of Christianity. As you can see, there's a flood. Um, the rainbow also comes into play here, as it does in Ezekiel, uh, with his visions of God. Um, we see two parents here, uh, while they're not born uh, from the breath of God, they are born in a tree uh, and populate the earth. Uh, we see this cow idea again, um, but the rest of it's kind of weird. We see the body forming the earth like we do in many myths, um, but the ice, uh, licking a man out of ice is something that we don't see in a lot of myths, probably because this is something that the Norse actually saw. Uh, I'm sure that they've ran across someone along the ways that was frozen in ice due to the ice ages that had occurred. Um, so this is kind of um, 
really specific to their own culture and not many other cultures. So we see this kind of come into play. The weather uh, and the climate come into play in the mythology as well as a warning. Um, I think this myth is uh, really elaborate. Uh, the poetic Eddas, when you read them as a whole, are extensive, just like other mythologies. Um, and we really don't have enough time to highlight all of the of the wonders of Norse mythology, but we will uh, come back to it when we get to uh, the apocalypse. Um, let's go on and look at some of the influences that the Norse gods have had. Before we do that, though, let's take a look at um, the pantheon itself, it's a fairly simple pantheon compared to Greek pantheons and Egyptian pantheons and some of these gods with 50 names. Uh, this is a fairly straightforward uh, pantheon. Uh, the intricacy comes in the worlds with this mythology more than the pantheon itself. Now back to those modern influences. Uh, we get many of our holiday traditions um, from these ancient Nordic and Germanic traditions. Uh, mistletoe is regulated to this area. Holly, the exchanging of gifts actually comes from Norse mythology as well as the Yule Log. And of course our modern influences are numerous. We uh, have lots of video games, TV series, uh, and movies that all surround Norse mythology because it's intricate. It's a warring type of culture. Um, and it's a, a, a culture that uh, that spans many different places. So you can take that story all over the world through the Viking and Norse mythology. Uh, we also get the days of the week from the Norse gods. So let's take a look at those real quick. So Monday is known as Mandar or Moon's Day. Uh, Tuesday is Tigsdar or Tears Day, who is a Norse god. Uh, Wednesday, of course, is Odin's Dar or Odin's Day. Um, Thursday is dedicated to our beloved Thor, Thor's Day. Uh, and Friday is Frigg's Day or Fragder. Uh, Saturday is a very interesting day, uh, Logger Day or Washing Day. Uh, and this comes from the Roman influence on the culture. Uh, you may have heard your grandmother or uh, older generations talk about uh, laundry day or bath day, and it's usually on Saturday. Uh, this is one of those remnants that comes from this ancient Norse and Roman mythology that mixed together. And of course, Sunday is from Sunardar, the god, uh, the Norse god, and it's known as Sunstay. Next week, we're going to be moving into floods and apocalypse, and we're probably most familiar, like I said, with Norse mythology through the Marvel myths. This last Thor movie, Ragnarok, um, doesn't end quite like the myth. So if you think that the ending where all the Asgardians are on a plane going to another world um, is how Ragnarok ends, you'll be sad to know that that is not the case. The Asgardians do not make it out so, uh, do not make it out of Ragnarok. Ragnarok is the final battle, and we'll see that in the next week as we move on. Uh, creation takes the longest time in the semester, and we're all really glad to move on when we're done with it. Um, so after this week and these last few lectures on uh, Japanese, Chinese, and African myths uh, and native myths, we'll um, move on to the apocalyptic and flood myths, which are much more fun. And then after spring break, we'll be looking more at modern um, ideas of mythology.